So in this process, God makes all the animals. Adam is there. He brings the animals. He's naming the animals. And brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Eve had not been created yet. So we have to ask ourselves this question. Why would God create Adam and have him without Eve deliberately? How many of you know that he did it deliberately? He just didn't do it because he, oh, I forgot, oh, I forgot to make Eve. That, that, that was not the case. So he makes Adam first, lets Adam get around the garden. He's taking care of it. He's responsible. Amen. Do you know that you're supposed to take good care of your pets, your animals? Mm -hmm. Supposed to take good care of your animals. If you have an animal and you abuse them, guess what? <laughs> you have a problem with the word of God. Because he never told Adam, go out and beat him. <laughs> and leave him out in the coal and abuse him. Amen? Glory to God. So that was verse 19. Now, this is Genesis um, 2.20, next verse. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, and to the fowls of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found help. What? Meat. A help? Meat. Made. For him. So Adam's looking at all the animals. You know, there's a, there's a bull. There's a, a cowgirl. <laughs> Joke. <laughs> Cow. <laughs> Got it? And, but there was no female. God did this deliberately. Did you understand that? So he would know what it was not to have a mate. So he would know what it was like not to have a mate. So if you do not have a mate, use it in the right way. God is teaching you what it is not to have a mate. So you'll appreciate your mate. Amen? You won't take them for granted. So, loneliness can teach you some things. And he deliberately made him first. Amen? Deliberately. How many of you remember when you were single? And you're waiting for your mate. Well, remember that. The next time you want to throw him out of bed. <laughs> Kick him off the couch. <laughs> All right. Now, Genesis 2, 22. Okay, we skipped a verse there. Because if we, I mean, we could read you the whole Bible, but it would take a lot longer than an hour to do this. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Wait for God to bring your mate. I want to talk to Eve right now. God is making you so that man will need you like he does a rib. Mm -hmm. How many have ever had a broken rib or a fractured rib? N not a nice experience. You got it? Notice that she was brought out out of his frame. Notice that there was bone included. Amen? Mm -hmm. The bone part of our body is the frame. Everything else goes on the frame, all the muscles, everything. So she's part of your frame. Amen, Adam? Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. And Adam said, this is now bone of my 
bones. The frame that holds everything up. Mm -hmm. She's part of that. And flesh are my flesh. The other things that go on the bone. So she's part of your structure, structural design, and she's also part of the muscles that cause things to move, cause the bones to move, amen? So she is a part of everything of you. You need her. She needs you. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of what? The man. She's part of me. She is part of me. Who named the woman? Adam. Adam named the woman. God didn't name the woman. So what are you naming your Eve? Are you naming her stupid? Because see, you can name Eve. When she comes into your life, you can name her sex only. You can name her many things. Inferior to me. There's a name. So it's important that you name her the right name. And you know what the right name is? What did her name mean? She shall be called what? Woman? Because she was taken what? So if you call her stupid, oh, you're stupid. she must have come from <laughs> something really stupid. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> true. Amen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> did you, did you, you guys get all of that? Yeah. So when we become one flesh... Whatever you call that one flesh is what you're calling yourself and what you're speaking into your destiny. Mm -hmm. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Who named Adam? God. God. And Adam is made after God's own what? image so if, if you're made after God's image then God might have a better opinion of you than you have of yourself that's why one of the commandments is to love your neighbor as you love your what self, self. so if you have the image of God God might be saying a lot nicer things about you than you can imagine. Because while we were yet sinners, God sent his only begotten son. Mm -hmm. It must be because you still, there was something in you. And here's love, that he first loved what? Us. So he didn't love the sin, but he loved you. Amen? So God names Adam. Adam names Eve. And they come from one another. So be careful what you name yourself or your spouse. Mm -hmm. Did you get that? Very important rule. If you're in ministry and you're calling your spouse um, funny things, funny things, 
your prayers will be hindered. Because the word of God says so. Amen? All right. So we're covering all of this stuff. And what I want, you married couples here, what I'm going to ask you to do, and this is for the next class, is you have one week to think of a name for your spouse. And those of you that are single, you have one week to come up with a name for your spouse that's coming. And remember, whatever you name them, it's going to stick with you. Amen? So, um, my wife is going to share something with you guys that uh, she told me, and I said, wow, that is really anointed. So, honey, can you share that yes. with them? This and, is, this before, is a heavy revy. Before I share this, I, I, if you're single, um, I just want to give you an example of something that I prayed and called my spouse before he came. And that was, God, a man that is not jealous, but loves you more than anything. And that's what I called him, and so that's what I got. You want to share with them why you well, had that particular request? The reason I had that request is because I came out of a really bad relationship of a lot of physical abuse, and it had to do with jealousy. Um, I had been in the hospital. I'd been beat up several times, three, four and a half years with the individual. Um, but before I could even walk into this relationship, I had to forgive that individual and, because, and pray for them that they would accept Christ. And later on through the years, they did. Um, but I prayed that because... I wanted to serve God, but I didn't want somebody that was going to hold me like this and wanted to know every single detail I was doing, where I was, everything, and in an abusive relationship. But I wanted somebody that if they loved God more than anything, they would not hurt me. Did, so did you understand? I mean, out of all the things that she could have asked God for was not what? To be jealous. Now you understand, huh? Mm -hmm. Not to be jealous. And I got that. So, um, praise God. That's why. So you think about those things, of what you're saying, because your words mean a lot on what you're saying, what you're calling your spouse. Okay, in John 2, 2, um, Pastor Jose and I were studying last night, and we were studying about marriage, that it begins and it ends with a marriage and at three o'clock this morning I opened up my eyes and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said the beginning of miracles happened in a marriage with Jesus so this is how important our marriages are and your future marriages you know those of you that are single and John 2 2 it says and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage so God called Jesus, the people at the wedding also called Jesus and the disciples, but first God called them to the marriage. So God called them to this marriage for a purpose. There was a reason in this marriage. And what happened was, you guys know the story of there was not no more wine and so they brought the water, the water in Jesus, that was the beginning of miracles, was the water being turned into wine. But this was the main purpose. This 2.11 says, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, it was the beginning of miracles, and manifested forth his glory. And his disciples believed on him. So the purpose was, to manifest the glory of God. His glory was being manifested 
the beginning of miracles, and his, it sealed the deal with his disciples. They believed in him. And so in our marriages, what God is doing is that we want our marriages to manifest the glory of God Amen. in our marriages because it's a shadow of God the Father, um, well, I mean, Jesus with us, with his bride getting ready. We're being prepared. So we want that manifested, the glory of God, in our marriages and that people will believe on Jesus. When they see your marriage and they see your example and they see the light of God in your marriage, they go, why do you have such a good marriage? Oh, it's Jesus. How do you figure out your problems? It's Jesus. And it shows forth the glory of God. Amen? You know, when you got married and those of you, when you will get married, mm -hmm. these are the things that will manifest on the day of your marriage. It will be a time of great miracles. Jesus did his first miracle at the wedding. His glory was revealed. In your marriage right now, God's glory. Mm -hmm. And it's an avenue for great miracles. Amen. Miracles started at a wedding. And the deal with the disciples, the apostles, was sealed at a marriage. Three great things. Because it says, and his disciples believed on him. What that means was that the deal was sealed mm -hmm. with the disciples. When you get married and you're living with somebody close, like the disciples lived with Jesus and with one another, glory to God. It's going to bring you to a place where you're going to know him through a relationship of transformation with another human being. People run from this, and we will run from it if we're not careful. But God's growth comes through us having contact with another human being. Did you get that? If you're standing before Almighty God, you're not going to say that you don't like his hairdo, that he doesn't like the right football team. You got it? But when you have another individual that is like you, You're entering into a relationship like Jesus had with his disciples. You have Jesus already. If you don't, you will by the end of the night. <laughs> Amen? You have Jesus. And that person that God has you with. You might be tempted to call him Peter. Peter. That person, that person, God is going to use that situation to bring you into his image. What does that mean? By the end of the whole thing, you're going to like them like God likes them. You're going to love them like God loves them. Did you get that? Because you're going to find things out about them that only God knows. <laughs> Their mama might not even know it. 
But young lady, women of God, you're going to know things about that man that his mama doesn't even know. And God is going to use that. Because what he's doing with all of us is he's bringing us to a place where he is at right now. We can love that person knowing, knowing those deep, dark secrets. And he still stays with you, doesn't he? So marriage is a deep thing. I want you to know that the person that you're married to is the most essential tool that God will use even more than an angel, even more than your guardian angel. Your guardian angel cannot develop you like your spouse can. Your guardian angel doesn't have the power to do that. Did you get that? You guys got that? All right. The amazing thing is that the first time in the Bible that God says, not good, guess when that is? It was way before Adam and Eve sinned. Did you know that? You know what he said? It is not good that man should be alone. Up to there, everything is good, 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 good. But all of a sudden, the first time he says, not good. In other words, it's not in that place, in that destiny that I have for them. Yes, Adam, you're in charge. You're in charge of the whole planet. You're taking care of it for me. The, the garden, should I say. Did you get that? But then he says it's not good. That man should be alone. Now wait a minute. He had God. Why would he need anybody else? God made us, and only how God would humble himself to do this is so deep. But God is so humble that he said, until they have another human being, they won't be complete. So God deliberately made Adam so he would need somebody else besides God also. Think about it. Why would God say it's not good that man should be alone? Sin hadn't happened yet, correct? He made us, those of you that are married, he made us, and he is so humble that he made us that we would need somebody other than just himself. If I was God, you know what I would have probably done? And now you'll know why I'm not God. I would have said, I'm it. If they have me, they need nothing else. God is so humble that he says they won't be completed unless I make another one that can be there and be a companion. Only God would be so humble or he would have never said it's not good.
he made him to know what it is not to have somebody. And through that process, when she came, he knew how to appreciate her. And she knew that I came from him. Don't you love the way God puts balances into things? The woman has to say, I wasn't made first, I came from Adam. But Adam can say, it wasn't good when I didn't have her. Mm -hmm. I had God, but God made it where I could not enter into his full good goodness until I had her. Because if God said it's not good when she was made and brought to him, it was good. that must have completed the goodness of God. Creation was completed. Not when the last bush was made, nor when man was made. Complete goodness came into the garden when God said, now I have them. Now Adam has complete goodness and Eve has complete what? Goodness. Little details, huh? Some people will think that's blasphemy. Why, that crazy person just said that? God made man that he would need something other than God. Doesn't that preacher know that all you need is God? Well, you just became smarter than God. Because he did it the other way. You just said you're smarter than him. What's your doctrine? What's your doctrine? That your doctrine doesn't insult the Almighty. Amen? Amen. Do you have anything to say, baby? Yes. Um, goodness. He that finds, it says, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. And not just a good thing, but he obtains favor of the Lord. So when you find that wife, you find a good thing. She's good. And you speak good things into her life. And you find favor of the Lord. The favor of the Lord comes. What I, uh, something I wanted to share is when, um, when I was talking to you about Jesus and the beginning of miracles and he turned the water into wine and all of these things and the glory of God it was showed forth and your marriages and everything, that if your marriage, and even those that are watching on the internet, if your marriage has become watered down, the miracle worker can come in. We have seen God do miracles in marriages. And he can make it the best wine of all. Because remember, in that marriage, in the wedding, they said, why did you save the best for last? And it can be the best. You can have the best marriage. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, hallelujah, we get... We got a good marriage. Praise God. Ours is sweet as wine. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, one of the secrets of marriage is having rules when you have a fight. Oh, we're, we're going to get to that one. That's, we're, that's Pastor Connie. And the, the, we're going to be teaching on that. <laughs> the problem with some marriages is they have no rules in the fight. You know you're going to disagree, right? Sooner or later. But if you have certain rules, got it? It'll kind of be like a basketball game. <laughs> Do you have rules in basketball? How about football? <laughs> Tennis? Amen? 
<laughs> it won't be so much a fight as it'll be a spectator sport. <laughs> But as long as you have the rules, the teams don't kill one another. <laughs> Amen? Yep. Praise God. You know, when we first got married, I, I, um, we never had one disagreement before we got married. A year and four months. We were married a month. We had a disagreement. I was like, oh my gosh. We had a disagreement. I, th I really thought Christian marriages didn't have disagreements. I was naive, <laughs> and, but we learned how to work through that. So that's our experiences that we want to teach you guys. So praise God. Yeah. We, we had one unique experience, okay? And this is really geared towards the men. When I married my wife, uh, remember, she came out of an abusive situation. Okay. And I remember being in a restaurant and I reached across to grab the salt and she went like this. I went. So and didn't remember doing it. So what do you think the people sitting around us in the restaurant thought? <laughs> you are a mean. The guy is an abuser. Wouldn't you think that? I mean, you're watching a couple and all of a sudden the guy goes across with a pepper and she... And men, let me tell you something about your wife having a wound or a flaw, whatever you want to call it. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that dinner. I had a choice of looking across the table and saying, do you know that all these people think that I'm a woman beater because of what you just did? And when it happened, you know, I kind of like, in a course, that thought's gonna come. Because see, your eagle and your reputation does not want anybody to think that you're a woman beater. And I could have taken the role of the victim and really given her a hard time. I mean, she just embarrassed me in front of everybody. But then I realized that our relationship and our marriage was more important than my reputation. And that's not the only time it happened. But I deliberately made the choice. And these are things that, you know, you have to be married to experience. And I had, I had to make the choice whether I was going to not care what anybody thought. Let the whole restaurant, the waiter, think that I'm a woman beater. Let them think that because the most important thing is for me to love my wife as Christ loves the church and take one for the team. <laughs> and work on getting her healed. Instead of getting all prideful, got it? And adding the compound or the multiplying her wound, by then, not only has she been beaten, but now I'm gonna put on her that the man that doesn't beat her, she has made him look like a piece of trash in front of everybody else. Satan would have loved that. Do you understand that? So I learned that 
you know that scripture, you read in scriptures, but then you come the time to learn. And I learned that husbands love your wives like Christ loves the church and even gave his life. In my case, my ego. Would my ego be crucified? So we men, and, and, I'm, and I'm speaking to myself, have to be careful when we deal with the biggest hurts in our wives' lives. Because my friend, my brother, that's when Jesus is going to ask you to love her like he loves the church and lay your ego down for her. Now, I'm sure she can tell you stories about my big flaw character, <laughs> my character flaws, where she's had to bite the bullet. <laughs> you got it? But that's where there's our respect. A mutual respect. So you just found out two very interesting things about us. Huh. There might be somebody watching over the internet now. These classes are going to be for real. We're not preaching. We're ministering. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yes. So... Have mercy. Men, ponder. What does that mean to love my wife like Christ loves the church? Women, ponder. What does it mean to look at my husband and to love him like Christ, like the church loves Christ? You get it? Do you have anything, honey? I... Um, when we first got married, the, I would read the scripture. You know, you, you just heard about the abuse that I came out of. And so I would read the scripture about um, wives submit to your husbands. And I was like, I don't like that. I would Actually, I'd open up the Bible and turn the page. And it'd say submit. Turn, I don't want to read that now, today. Why do you think that was? Because of the hurt. If that's happening with you, mm -hmm. guess what? You got to deal with some hurt. You got to deal with your hurts. What caused that hurt? And so I asked God, I'll do this, but you just got to tell me why. I will do this. And, and he explained it to me, the Lord explained it to me as it was a respect. And when I read that, this is what the Lord told me. He said... It took me three years, you guys. But, and uh, I love you. Um, but it doesn't have to take you three years. So don't say, oh, well, now I got a license that Pastor Tony it took her three years, so I don't have to do this for three years, okay? No, you got the answer today. I had to go through it to get the answer. I didn't get the opportunity of premarital counseling. So what happened, God was my counselor. Jose was my counselor. God used him to touch my life, to heal the wounds, the hurts, because I, I don't feel like I was that person that was abused, but during the process, it was very painful. So what happened is God spoke to me and he said, because you need to be an example to the body of Christ on the way the body of Christ is supposed to submit themselves to me. Because it says, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as the body submits to Christ. And I said, oh, I could do that. Because I love you, Jesus. So I could do that. And that was it. It was broken. I was free. But um, God really used that. Yeah. So I just wanted to share that with you. And I uh, want to go to the end of the, the marriage. Yeah, this is, you know, the first class. So we're just. We're just hitting the surface. Remember, it started with the marriage in the garden, and it ends with the marriage supper what? 
Or the Lamb. Of the Lamb. That's when the completion of the church, that's when the church is ready to do her job into eternity, after the marriage supper of the Lamb. You're getting trained right now through marriage and being single. You're going through a process. You're going through a process that is going to qualify you for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. This is your premarital counseling. For, for heaven. Amen. Amen. Revelations 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife has made herself ready. She's made herself what? Ready. Ready. Remember when you got married? How you made yourself ready? Mm -hmm. Men and women? Even if you did it the justice of the peace, don't tell me you didn't get ready. I know at least you washed your hands. <laughs> if you were working on your car or something. You made yourself ready. Are we making ourselves ready? That's what this class is all about. We're making ourselves ready for this event. Some will not be ready. But do you want to be ready? Amen. That's why marriage is so important to God. Remember what Paul said? He's talking about marriage, a man and a woman, and he says, however, I'm speaking a mystery. Mm -hmm. And I'm really speaking about what? Christ and the church. All of a sudden, he just takes a right-hand turn. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more to this marriage stuff than meets the eye. That's why the devil has come so strongly against it. It has the power to bring the glory of God. Jesus manifested his glory the first time where? In a marriage. He did his first miracle in a marriage. And he sealed the deal with the apostles doing the marriage. That same marriage. Those are three things that the devil wants to take out. How does he do it? By damaging the marriage. Spiritual laws. Huh. And to her was granted. Next verse. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine what? Linen. Clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the what? Saints. All the stuff you do for Jesus. <laughs> All the stuff you're doing for your wife or your husband. All the stuff we're going to be doing, doing this outreach this weekend. You know what that beautiful linen is, clothing? It's the righteousness of the saints. Mm. When I went to heaven, I saw the saints wearing their robes. And the material was the righteousness of the saints. Whatever you do here, it's being transformed into your garment. I don't know all the details, but I'm telling you. Hallelujah. And he said unto me, write these, uh, write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb. lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Wow. We're gonna we gotta finish this real quick. Revelations twenty two sixteen. 
I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. You know that word angel there? You know what that word means? Do you know that's a pastor? He told John, write a letter to the seven angels of the seven churches. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you something? When has God in the entire Bible had a man write a letter for an angel to read? <laughs> that word means angel, a messenger, especially an angel, by implication a pastor. Those letters were written to the seven pastors of the seven churches. I always wonder, well, how can, I, how can John write a letter? What's the address of the angel? Does he walk <laughs> up to the church and say, hi, hey, give this to your angel? When have when you ever seen the word of God where God says that a man writes a letter or, or, or a man becomes a messenger to the angel? Hi, angel. Uh, I'm here to, to, to give you a prophetic word from God. Uh, in the future, this is going to happen to you. Really? I already knew that. So that word is pastor. It was a letter to the seven pastors. And guess who Jesus is addressing? And I, Jesus, have... Uh, I have, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and of the bright and morning star. You have a word for John being called an angel, and then you have the pastors being called angels that will read these letters to the congregation. They'll minister these things to their congregation. Revelations 1.20 the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the, are the seven what? Are the angels of the seven churches. Of the seven churches. That word is the same word. The letter is to the seven pastors. Of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven what? Churches. Churches. The candlesticks of the churches and the angels, guess what they are? The pastors of the churches. Same thing here. Unto the angel of the church of what? Ephesus. Ephesus, right, these things. Says he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Unto the angel of that church, I'm the one that holds all the pastors in my hand. Mm -hmm. Who walk in the midst of the seven, seven what? Golden candlesticks. In the midst of the seven churches. churches. He's walking tonight. He's here. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit. Listen. And the spirit and the bride say, are you the bride? Yes. And the spirit of the bride say, come. And let him who heareth say, come. come. The spirit and the bride are speaking the same thing. That's what we're doing this weekend. We're telling them, come. I think I'm ministering to the bride. Because you've been doing this stuff. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that... Hear us say, come. And let him that is a thirst, come. come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life Free. freely. So the Holy Spirit and the bride are winning souls. Mm -hmm. Come. And as we move into this marriage class, it's not just this marriage but we're getting ready for the, our marriage. Because mm -hmm. remember, the Bible says that the virgins were waiting for what? The bridegroom. Right. 
So God bless you. It's been a pleasure. And you're really going to get some stuff out of this. Amen? Amen. Those of you watching over the internet, God bless you. And may the Holy Spirit haunt you with his peace. Amen. Mwah. Okay, so what I have here tonight. Honey, for... you should have waited a little longer for, oh. Oh. you know, we're doing video. So you got to give them a little time. <laughs> They're doing a little bit here. Sorry. Um, Connie has. I mean, I like this couch. It's comfortable. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What we have here for tempted. all of you is <laughs> this is a date. Okay.